Hello everybody, welcome back to the Game Blocks tutorial videos. This is the first tutorial video which explains how to set up the tools and get ready to use Game Blocks. Um, in general, I'm going to try to move pretty quickly through these tutorials uh, faster than I would during a lecture because it is a uh, video, so you can pause and, and rewind if you miss anything. And hopefully that will keep the pace moving pretty well. So first of all, what you need to do to use Game Blocks is to go and install BYOB. So typically go to your favorite search engine since we no longer remember information in the 21st century. And typically I type the name of the tool I want and then programming. We're also going to look at Scratch. But what you really need, the main thing you need is BYOB. So something like this should come up, build your own blocks from Berkeley um, University. If you go there you'll see a page like this. And it's just about as simple as clicking on download and uh, pick your uh, your system, Macintosh, Windows. There's also instructions for Unix down here, which are a little more complicated. Um, and you should be up and running. I'm not going to go through the installer on this video, so um, we'll just jump right into BYOB. Uh, but before we do that, I want to show one more program. Uh, BYOB is based on Scratch, so you may want to actually grab some documentation from the Scratch website. Um, so, talk to programming again, because they have some great, they have really a, a great introductory um, tutorial. So, the way to get to it is to go to download at the Scratch site. You might be able to search for it too. There are the installers for Scratch, uh, which is a sort of stripped down version of BYOB in, in a way. And go to getting started with Scratch. And down here, somewhere, there should be a direct link. They have, they have video tutorials. Where is it? There, the Getting Started Guides. You want to grab this. It's uh, like a 12 page or 20 page, very simple guide that steps you through every uh, key type of block and how to put them together. So it's a really, really great starting point. To get the game blocks themselves, go to newlifeinteractive.com and look for the Technologies section. Um, this page will change, but you should be able to find a game block section further down. And at the top of that should be a link to a zip file that contains the blocks. So the process will be to download that file and unpack it on your machine into a folder. Uh, this page will also contain a list of all the videos in order, as well as uh, broken down by section. So use this page to um, find the tutorials you may need for the type of game you're working on or the task you need to do. Uh, one other tip about these tutorial videos, uh, be sure that the setting in YouTube is set to high res. Uh, they were recorded in high res so you can see the text of the blocks themselves. Um, so just make sure that you're um, able to see uh, a clear picture. Um, so with that, um, you will have downloaded the blocks to a folder. And the next step will be to go to BYOB. And this could be a project you're already working on, or it could be a brand new project. And the way you bring in a file is by just going to Import Project, which you want to import it into something you're working on. Um, it'll take me a second to navigate down through my folders. But you basically just go find the folder that you unpacked. So uh, hopefully it will be this number for the first release, but it may be different by the time you're watching this video. Um, so you go to the folder you unpacked. There is an examples folder, and this contains most of the examples you see in the tutorial videos. So you can go here to see the running code from the videos and, and you know mess with it and see it in action. Um, Multi sprite is kind of a, a, a kind of an obscure sounding name that, that it contains a useful tutorial on talk trees, I believe. So it's a good place to look at if you're doing that type of game. Um, so that's that's the examples. The blocks themselves are in a separate folder called blocks. And what you want to import is core blocks right here. And that's most of what you, what you need. Um, most of the functions that are in the toolkit are there. And I didn't want to do this to people, but there are separate libraries for cartoons and physics blocks. And the reason I did that is that the BYOB interface here gets a little sluggish on older computers with a lot of blocks loaded. Um, so uh, basically you want to use physics only if you really need it, if you're doing a platformer with, with um, 
Gravity, for instance, or a space action game. Um, and cartoon blocks are, are not quite as heavy. You might want to use those for animations. Um, but I broke those out as well because they're big. But So what you want is to import core blocks. Now this performance issue seems to be resolved in BYOB 4, which is called Snap. Uh, but the uh, BYOB 4 is not yet fully featured enough to support this toolkit. So the uh, likely timeline is that uh, the toolkit will be migrated sometime in 2013, maybe summer 2013. And uh, then hopefully those problems will go away and life will be simpler. But anyway, this is what you see when you load the blocks in. Uh, there's some documentation that comes in attached to this sprite. Uh, most of this is documentation for a toolkit that is delivered with BYOB itself uh, called simply tool tools and um, I kept most of those blocks intact because they're they're very useful and they help build other blocks so um, for the ones I kept I kept the documentation here for reference uh, and you can keep this in your project if you want for reference or you can remove the sprite which is what I'm going to do here and now you're back to the same project you had but the thing that's different is that at the bottom of these different sections you should see new blocks and uh, these are for movement here. Here's one for capturing the, the dragging of a mouse click on a sprite. And you should be able to then use these blocks for various um, game making tasks. Here's an in some inventory blocks, some blocks for dialogue. So now we're ready to go. What is BYOB and how do you use it? Um, so we'll start out with just the basics. These are sprites over here on what's called the stage. You can you know put them wherever you want. Um, there are aspects of a sprite. So these tabs here let you look inside the sprite and see what's there. So this is scripts. I'm just going to drag out a block to see to show you what the deal is. So you can drag com commands out and do things. I'm not going to do anything right now, but these are the scripts of the sprite. You click here to go to costumes. You can draw whatever you want for a costume. You can also edit an existing costume and do things like um, rotate the creature a little, little bit. We're going to pretend like he got knocked over by a monster. It's part of this tutorial. So uh, actually, I want to do a separate um, image of that. There. So we're going to copy this existing one to exactly what I just did and save it out. So now we have um, two costumes two with its own name, costume one, costume two, and we can refer to those with the blocks and you'll see in a minute. You also have sounds associated with the character, so if you want some dialogue or sound effects, you can import them right here and access those with the blocks. So there you go, so three things for a sprite. So typically to find your stuff when you get started, it's going to be confusing. You need to be, have clicked on the sprite you're thinking about and want to manipulate and then go over here and click on the tab of the thing you want to mess with, either the pictures, the sounds, or the, the scripts. There's also a stage. So here, down here, it's a very special object called the stage, which um, is important just because uh, this is where you switch out what the background is. If you're making multiple levels in a game, in instead of costumes, you have backgrounds. You can draw whatever you want. Um, so I'll show that real quick. Draw some hills around the mountains, perhaps. And there we go. Um, and then, of course, there are also sounds associated with the stage. So you can do some global uh, ha handling here. If you have some global sound effects you wanted to play, depending on certain conditions, you put that here and put the code here. Um, and so, you know, the stage, stage has its own code. So that's one of the things novices might get confused with. If the stage is selected, you're not seeing the code for your sprite, that kind of thing. Okay, so those are the basic aspects of the interface. Let's go back to the sprite. Now, for a game, typically what you want to do is set up a beginning state. You want to tell, you, you know, put all the pieces in place for level one and the start of level one. So you can write some code to do that. Now, before we get the full logic, let's go and just see how these blocks work. So to make an object move, you can use something like this. You just get a block, and it defaults to the current location of the object. So it's not going to do anything if I click on it right now shouldn't anyway. It's a little slow. I wonder if our video recording is slowing things down. Interesting. Well, we'll, we'll mess with this more in a second. So, 
this sprite here, uh, when you move it, you'll see these numbers up here changing. This is x and y, just like from algebra class, you've got x axis is left and right, y is up and down, and just like algebra class, the y axis going up is positive. This is different than um, most APIs, most programming interfaces to games. So those of you who are used to game programming will uh, want to take note of that. Zero, zero is right here in the middle. So it's just like, you know, the, the Cartesian coordinate plane out of algebra. But as you move him, these numbers change, and that can tell you what to put in here. So you, you say to yourself, I want him to start right about here. So you go there, you look at these numbers, negative 167 by negative 35. So this is the one I have to change. There we go, that's his starting point. And then he should be able to, to jump there when I click on this. There, it's actually doing it. Okay, we're just not seeing the highlight. So these blocks are actually live. When you bring them in here, you can tinker with them and make sure they're doing what you want before you add them to your code. Um, but So we want, at the start of the game, the this, this green flag here means uh, when the game starts. Uh, you start a game by pressing the green flag. You can pause it or stop it over here. So pressing that green flag causes this to be executed. And then we can put him at the starting point of the game. So we move him over here. He's been playing and battling and stuff. And then, boom, the game is starting. So we're on our way to uh, do other things at the start of the game. We just add blocks to the script. We don't want him to be lying down at the start of the game. So we'll switch to costume one. And there we go. Now, you know, to test code, you can just double click on it in the um, scripts panel over here. or it will also get run when you start the game. Okay, so we've got a character. Let's add a monster. So to add an, another sprite, you just go here. You can pick one out of a library. That's what this folder is here. Or you can draw one. Draw one just brings up a paint editor. And we're not going to draw one right now. Let's just go ahead and grab one from the library so I can show you that. And this one just grabs a random one. Uh, so that's, that can be fun. I guess. Let's just go to Fantasy, so it gives you some folders. You can grab a monster. Oh, that looks pretty scary. Um, let's see. Here's a pretty scary one, too. We'll use him. Okay, so he should show up here. And there we go. Monster. So we're going to do the same thing with him. We want to figure out, figure out where he wants to be at the start of the first level. We'll stick him here. Read his numbers off. 103 by negative 11. So, see, he's highlighted, so we're seeing his scripts. We can go here and get the same condition for him for the start of the game. So when the game starts, we'll set him at a certain place. And look at that. Uh, BYOB's been nice and rem remembered what his position was, so we're ready to go. Um, he's facing the wrong way, though, isn't he? So let's just go into his costumes and edit. Uh, and we're just going to flip this picture. We're not going to animate him. So there he is. And start of the game, everything's messed up. They've been battling. And they go to their starting positions. Okay. So make sure things are stopped. Um, that's not too exciting. So let's go ahead and make him move and on kind of a patrol path. So the way you do that is you just you add some more code. We can do that for him. He's going to be a simple creature. We'll just put it all in his start script. When you get more code, you might want to break it up into separate scripts. But uh, first thing we can do is make him move somewhere. So we'll have him glide somewhere. So you can see this command. It starts out defaulting to his position, but we want to change him vertically. We have him go up and down. So we can change Y here and make it whatever 120. We can go up a ways. If I double click it here, it should work. Make him do it. So you see, it makes him animate up. So that's great. We would want another command that, and here I'll show you a trick now. If you want to duplicate something you've done, you can right click on it, go to duplicate, things like that. Programmers always are always using cut and paste. It's a tried and true technique to save yourself time. Um, oops, we're not going to change X. We're going to go back to where we started, which was, what was it, negative 11? Okay, so bring him back down. We do something like this. He's back down. We can stick him together with the power of blocks, like Legos, and he goes up and down. Now, if he does it once, that's uh, interesting, but it's not much of a patrol path. Uh, we need to make him do it continuously. So to do that, 
we go to this control area and there are quite a few blocks here for controlling how many times a command executes. This could would do it ten times or in doing some logic um, if a condition is true do something. Uh, we'll do examples of those later but for now we just want to make them do something forever so we can wrap this forever block around those commands. I really like this visual. This is maybe the one reason that's attracted me to the, the block system for um, doing beginning programming. It, it really matches the concept that a programmer has in their mind I think when they're building things like this. So you can rec run this as well by double clicking on it without running the game and you can see that it's working. And We press stop to stop all of our code fragments from running and we just stick it up here. And now we have a game with the monster threatening the player. To make the player move, let's keep it simple. Let's just grab one of the game blocks, uh, movement blocks. Uh, I guess this first one should be good. Um, so this is a block that will just handle four-way movement for you. Uh, you give it a speed, and then there are a couple more fields that need to be filled in. So um, I'll talk about those real quick. So first of all, we want this to run when the game starts. So this will just kind of stand off on its own. Just put it wherever. Um, it will. This particular block will block. Will will block. It will stop execution of the script and loop infinitely, just handling the movement for you. Um, there's another version that uh, will just do it every frame if you prefer to loop and just kind of pull the system, or uh, I guess what you call tick the system to keep it going. But this one will just kind of handle it. Uh, but in order for it to handle it, um, it needs to know a couple pieces of information. One is to know um, when is it supposed to handle the movement. And that's what this first one, this first piece of logic here will tell it. Uh, because you, you'll want to turn it off sometimes. You'll have a cutscene or something and you'll want the, to disable the, the movement key. So you have a piece of logic here that would, could basically say something like character state equals moving. Um, and then the second piece uh, is a piece of logic for it to execute to let know whether the player is collided with something. So if you have walls or, or something, then um, you can use that to uh, have a piece of logic saying if character touching uh, this particular sprite or something. Um, and future tutorials, the tutorial on movement will show how to use that to, to make an easily swap swappable uh, set of walls that you can use. Uh, for each screen that uh, is in the game. So uh, a lot of preamble there. Um, again, that tutorial is, is uh, a separate video. But for now, let's just drag out a true to put into this uh, uh, whenever. Um, and that will basically tell it to always have movement active. Notice there's a gray bar around it. You need to drag it in so that the gray bar appears. This way is, it comes in cleanly, but this will execute it instantly and just once. What we want to do is say, hey, hold on to this and execute it every time the script needs to. So by putting a gray border around it, we're going to turn it into a little piece of uh, reusable code. So and we're going to do a false for this colliding, uh, collide when. But basically, we're going to say we're never going to bump into anything. We're not going to have collision in this particular um, example. So with that, when we execute, we should be able to use the arrow keys to move around. Okay, it was just that one, that one block, and you see it's all still white and highlighted. That means the script is still running. It's stopped on this block, and it's just going to run forever on this block. So you couldn't put anything after it in the script. Um, that's just how that particular one works. Here we go. So suddenly we have movement. So this is one of the benefits of the blocks library is you can just get all this code, which would be about half a page of code, working right away. So there we go. We've got stuff happening, except the monster who doesn't do anything when you crash into him. So that's not too exciting. So here's where we want to make the uh, player fall over when he hits the monster. And there's different ways you can organize this. I often do it in the monster itself and have him send a message to the character. But I do believe that, let's see, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do a little loop. So we, we want to create a script that listens for the case or what watches for the case of the character bumping into the monster. So we're basically going to go and create a, a separate script that runs in parallel. And we, now we have three scripts running in parallel. So what, another great thing about these blocks is they actually let you do some pretty sophisticated programming. You know, parallel operations could, can be kind of tedious in, in other um, 
systems, different types of programming. But here they just everything runs in parallel uh, automatically. And we're going to forever check whether we're, we've bumped into this monster. So I grabbed a forever loop. And what we want to do there is we're going to use an if condition to check whether we're touching it. So now we're getting a little bit more logic here. Um, so forever, we're going to just loop over and over and say, am I touching him? Am I touching him? Am I touching him? Uh, so that little diamond shape there takes a spe special type of block. You can see they're all shaped to tell you where they go, you know, which ones you can use. And we want to grab the one that says, am I touching somebody? So we'll drop that there. If I'm touching, la -di da you can pull down a pull down and you can see how yeah, we have the choice of Sprite 2, the only other Sprite in the game. So if I'm touching Sprite 2, we will take an action, uh, and that will be to switch our costumes. So we've already used this block here to initialize ourselves to costume one. Uh, when we're touching the monster, we will fall down. Show costume two. So let's play the game now. We are. We can, we're moving. We're trying to get around him. He's a pretty tough character. Oh, he got us. All right. And you know what? We can still move. <laughs> so we'd have to add more blocks to actually end the game. And uh, Real quickly, I can show you that it's in the control section. Stop all. You know, we can stop the game there if we've lost the game. So that's the basics. Uh, that gives you a tour of how to use BYOB um, and one of the blocks you can use from the Game Blocks library. Uh, t stay tuned to other videos for more on the specific blocks themselves. So a couple of advanced notes about using game blocks. Um, once you've been using it a while, you'll, you'll notice there are some of these um, uh, variables that show up uh, into your system. I'm in this orange variables section. This is where you store the um, logic and um, states of objects and that sort of thing. If you see anything in all caps, that is something that the blocks depend on. Um, strictly speaking, I don't think all of these really need to be here. They can be cleaned up a bit. But um, you'll want to just leave those alone. You'll interact with these, especially these inventory blocks here. Uh, sorry, these inventory variables. Um, but you don't want to delete them because the system depends upon them. Um, likewise, that you'll see some blocks that are in all capitals. Let's go here to motion. And there's one right there, GB make a physics loop. I try to precede them with GB to let you know it's from game blocks. And those are also internal. You shouldn't need to ever use something like that, but it's needed by some of these other blocks up above it. So um, just keep those in mind, those things in mind. A couple other advanced notes is that um, you can change your layout here by clicking on this to get more room for your scripts. Um, a student showed me that after about a year of me using this tool. Um, another important thing is to know that you can run full screen by clicking on this. You do this, you're in full screen mode. You actually will want to do this most of the time when you test, especially if you integrate mouse interactions, because if you're in this other mode uh, and you click on a sprite, you'll the UI handling may take over. You may end up being able to drag the sprite around just because you're in an edit pane. So you know, when, if you're dragging objects in between sprites, you'll want to be running full screen to turn that off. And um, that's it for the advanced notes. Um, good luck. One more thing about the BYOB interface. Uh, once you're done with your game and you have something you want to share with someone else, uh, well, what you can do is go to the share um, pull down and there's some other options but if you do compile this project it will begin building the project and you will get an executable that you can share with friends or whoever and they won't need to install BYOB or anything like that. They can just take the executable and run it. So as you can see it popped up here. It put it automatically in my documents folder here under Windows 7. And there we go. We have a game. And um, like I said, when you give this to somebody they don't have to install BYOB or anything. You need to tell them to press the green flag but otherwise they're up and running and can play your game. Um, on the Mac, I think it shows up on your uh, desktop. Oh, and I, I see this under Windows 7 for some reason, uh, an error, but the game does run. Uh, it just gets when you when you close the game. Um, so uh, if you can see here, this is the path where it shows up. C users, username, documents. 
Um, so if you, if you can't find it, if it doesn't pop up automatically, go looking in some standard system folder like that. You don't get the option of where to save it. So that's the one tricky thing. And I think that's it on the DYOB interface.